Hello, and welcome to a brand new day of free-to-play here on Magic the Gathering Arena. Get the dish on the latest with me, Lord Rumfish. Uh, this is the Deck Building Toolbox series. We're on green in Wilds of Eldrain. Uh, just real quickly, uh, a Deck Building Toolbox, the idea here is to get cards that serve a wide variety of roles that you can put into a wide variety of decks. The other thing I'm highlighting here are kernels of ideas for deck building. So uh, this is not strictly a crafting guide. You follow along and you decide, you know, which of the things I described sound like they are the tool for you, that they are the right tool for the toolbox. And you kind of know for yourself what play styles you enjoy and which ones you don't. Um, with that in mind, uh, green's going to be a big one. It's my favorite color. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so right off the bat, we've got Brave the Wilds. One green sorcery common. So the uh, the basic use of it is to go find a basic land, reveal it, put it in your hand, and shuffle. That's fine. We've got a couple other cards in standard that do this effect. One of them can proliferate instead of doing the land search. One of them can fight instead of doing the land search. So what about this one? This one, if you bargain it, right, sacrifice an enchantment, artifact, or token, then a land you control becomes a 3-3 elemental creature with haste that's still a land. It doesn't end at end of turn. You turn a land into a 3-3, and you find another land. So, uh, you know, worst case scenario, if the opponent manages to kill your 3-3, you have at least found another land to replace that land. It doesn't uh, help you get ahead on land drops, though. So, you know, if you found a way to play this turn one, which I'd... That would be a challenge. That would be a real challenge. I don't... Is there a way in standard that you could actually play this on turn one? You need something to bargain. I don't know if that's possible in standard. Uh, in older formats, you know, you got ornithopters and other stuff that you could play this on turn one. You probably don't need to because the land would be tapped and you couldn't attack with it that turn. So it's more likely the most aggressive start you could get with this would be turn two, where you played something turn one that gave you stuff that you could bargain turn two, you can have an untapped land that's ready to be a 3-3 with haste. Um, you probably don't need to do that though. I think most of the time if you're running Brave the Wilds, you probably use it as a land search early in the game, unless you really don't need the lands, in which case you might be happy to turn one of them into a 3-3, three, three, you know, if you're just getting flooded out. Um, this spell is fine. Uh, it is just fine. It serves a decent role in your deck at the, you know, opening of the game. Make sure you hit your land drops. And it can be a 3-3. You need something to sacrifice to do that, so there's a little bit of a deck building consideration there. Overall, it's not like a sure thing, it's not a shoe in but um, I think I could experiment with this and potentially see it playing a good role in a deck. So, uh, you know, up to you. Royal Treatment, this one is pretty amazing. Um, so for a typical deck, I might say that one or two copies of this could replace, you know, your Tyvar Stand, your, um, oh, the one from Kamigawa that gains two life. This one gives a permanent plus one plus one and ward one. And at instant speed it also does hexproof until end of turn. So it's a good protection spell. It puts an extra permanent onto the battlefield that you could use for bargaining could be of use in an enchantments deck as well. Um, could be good next to cards like the Bunnicorn. And all of that, right, all of those use cases that I just described are things that are different from those other protection spells we just talked about. Putting out a permanent, even just a little token aura, is a big difference. And I think that means that there are some decks that could consider going up to four copies of this card. Uh, if you're just using it 
you know, in a typical kind of mid-rangey beatdown whatever style plan, then like one or two copies would serve your deck just fine. Um, and other decks are going to want to go all in. It's a good card. All right, Bestial Bloodline. This is not a very good card. Uh, the reason I highlight it here is as a single copy. Just one. Um, because, a little bit of magic history here. Uh, there was an old card in red. Um, was it Giant Strength? It was uh, gave a creature plus two, plus two, cost two red mana. And that, at the time, was a big power boost that also effectively had haste because the thing you put it on could attack that turn. Um, so this card has pedigree going all the way back to that aura. Um, now, granted formats have changed, auras have always been card disadvantaged, but this one um, doesn't have to be. In a very long game, you could cycle this back around to your hand. The reason I wouldn't say more than one copy is uh, five mana is a lot. <laughs> a whole lot. You have better things to do most of the time, but if you wanted a budget option in an enchantment kind of themed deck or an aura themed deck that you could regrow and get additional value from in a long game, in a grindy game, then uh, when you're doing, you know, a budget deck, I think one copy of this in that kind of deck would be just fine, actually. And I don't think I'd go in for more than one copy, probably. But I, I could see the use cases in a budget kind of deck. In a non-budget deck, you will probably have better cards and better things to do with your time. But this could be a very aggressive line uh, for a lot of decks, and it's got long game value. Just pointing that out. Intrepid Truffle Snout. This is an interesting card to me. So both sides of the card are just slightly below rate. Right? Like a 3-1 for 2 is fine. It's nothing exciting, but it, it sees play in aggro decks and stuff. Um, the adventure side is fine. It's nothing exciting. You can... At instant speed, give a creature plus two, plus two. You can save it from some kinds of removal. Blow out a combat. Um, you know, the, it has its uses, for sure, as the adventure. It has its uses as a three power two drop. And the interesting part to me is that whenever this attacks alone, you make a food token. Which means you could get this down early, and as if you manage to get an attack in with it, then it's put some extra material out onto the battlefield, future copies of this that you run across in your deck, you can play the adventure side on it first before you play out the two drop. You know, you might reach a point where you can't afford to attack alone just to get the food token, but it's going to come up in the early game often enough that um, the early game's weighted to matter more in Magic. Things that matter in the early game tend to perform better. Um, you have to work really hard for cards that perform well in the late game to have a function in your deck. You have to build the deck for them. Uh, this one's kind of got its value up front, kind of built in. Um, you can put out food for you to bargain, to gain life with. I think this card is maybe not bad. I am curious to see if it might work out in some kind of a value-oriented deck that also wants a two-drop. Which is probably most decks, to be honest. We got a lot of two drops to cover today. Red Tooth Vanguard. There's a card we're going to look at when we get to uh, multicolor. Anything that's got an off color activation on it, I put into the multicolor at the end. So that'll be the final video. So um, this is not as good as the Mossy Knight. But it still might be pretty good. So you get a three power trampler for two mana. The trample's kind of nice. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you can pay two and return this from your graveyard to your hand. Now, uh, the Dread Moss Knight, um, or whatnot, is almost always a better card, but it is a rare, 
And this is a budget option, and this card does a lot of what that card does. It also has Trample. It also has three power. Uh, notably has one toughness instead of two. It does not draw you a card with an adventure on it. Uh, the thing I think this could pair well with are the Sagas from Kamigawa, Neon Dynasty, that turn into creatures because they... Um, Right, they exile, they leave the battlefield, they come back as an enchantment. You've got your mana open when that's happening. Which means you should be able to pay the two colorless to regrow this back from your graveyard. And that seems like a neat deck to me, and you don't need black mana to get the value out of this. So, you know, Dreadmoss Knight might be the better option if you've got any black in your deck. But if your deck isn't black and you wanted to run some kind of like a interesting saga deck, enchantment deck, something like that, this could maybe see some play. Um, so I, I would not ignore this card. All right, if you don't have black in the deck, then this could be a suitable replacement for uh, Dreadmoss Knight. Root Rider Fawn, the name of this card uh, seems a little risque. Uh, that's quite a smile she has there. Anyway, there are better cards in Standard. Um, but this Seder is playable. It's fine. It's a fine card. It will do good work in a green deck. There are better mana producers. Right, um, just off the top of my head, there's one that can animate lands into three threes. There's one that if you have creatures in your graveyard, it turns into a four four. Uh, and those tap for any color of mana. This one, you have to jump through a hoop to make any color of mana by, like, instead of producing mana, you actually have to filter a mana. But as far as a budget option goes, man, this is a great budget option for uh, if you're early on on Magic Arena trying to put together a green deck. Yeah, this will block for you. This will make mana for you and ramp. This will even fix your mana for you. Um, I like it. If you're making a budget deck, this is good. Uh, Titanic Growth is not so great. Um, I highlight it here just to mention that if you have um, a really quick start with creatures that are like Hexproof or Ward. And if you have a decent count of things that have Trample or Give Trample, then um, this could represent a lot of damage to the opponent's face in that case. And you could treat it kind of like a burn spell. As long as you have a high density of creatures that are likely to connect with the opponent in some way. I still wouldn't tell you that this is a great spell, but um, there are some kinds of aggressive decks that could cheese out the opponent pretty quickly if you're running this card. Prowess creatures uh, turn gigantic, of course, so uh, just food for thought. Speaking of food, we have Tough Cookie here. Um, this card does a lot of stuff. So you get a 2-2 two, two for 2. It's also an artifact. It also makes a food, so it actually has two artifacts. And then it can animate non-creature artifacts into 4-4s four if you have mana. And you can sacrifice this to gain life. Um, there is a lot going on here. The fact that it puts two permanents onto the battlefield and then it can animate your artifacts is kind of neat. Um... This is a surprisingly threatening card that once it resolves, anytime you're getting artifacts out, you could just threaten to activate this card and swing in with them. It gets me thinking. Um, you know, if you had like a control matchup where you think you might have a tough time resolving a spell, it's not too hard to get something down on the early turns of the game, like Tough Cookie. And then instead of playing a spell, you could just, you know, activate his ability. There are lands that can make artifact tokens as well, right? There's one that makes power stones. Um, I think Voldaren Estate makes uh, blood. 
But you probably want the one that makes power stones more than that. Um, yeah. There are ways that you can get artifacts onto the field without ever casting a spell. Then you can activate the tough cookie to go ahead and be swinging in with four fours, which uh, it's not quite big enough to deal with. Um, in the I'm thinking of the blue deck specifically. It's big enough to threaten a uh, Dijin. It's not big enough to threaten the uh, serpents, the five fives with ward. But still, if you have a start like that against a blue deck, they're not going to be very happy to see you with these early creatures that threaten yet more damage down the line that doesn't require casting a spell. Uh, it's neat. It's, uh, it's very neat. Good for an artifact synergy deck. There's a lot going on here. So I, I think this is definitely a tool for the toolbox. All right, Troublemaker Oof. Or Oofy. I'm just going to say Oof. It's a 2-2 two, two for 2. And if you don't bargain it, that's all it does. You know, it's just a bear. But if you do bargain it, um, you can exile an artifact or enchantment and opponent controls. I've been finding no shortage of artifacts and enchantments to blow up. Um, some opponents run so many, uh, it's like you actually have to be cautious about what you choose to blow up because their whole deck is just enchantments and artifacts and so you have to pick out the most valuable targets to destroy with these effects. So I don't know if you can run too many of this effect in a deck or not. <laughs> this, I wish it just, you know, entered the battlefield and blew up something or exiled something. I wish there wasn't the bargain attached to it. Because that means what could have been like an automatic include into all kinds of green decks, now it's... You have to be able to bargain it. If you can't bargain it, it's just kind of worthless. If you can bargain it, and you can bargain it, you know, very reliably, then it's quite good. So whether or not it's going to uh, be good for your deck depends on the composition of your deck, and I still think it's a pretty good tool to have in the toolbox. Uh, up the Beanstalk, this is making some waves in some older formats, uh, particularly uh, where there are pitch spells, spells you can cast for alternate costs. Um, those spells have always been problematic. I don't know why they keep making them. <laughs> now got Up the Beanstalk. So whenever it enters the battlefield and whenever you cast a spell with mana value 5 or greater, you draw a card. And as it turns out, that's not that difficult of a condition to fulfill, and it draws a card anyway, as soon as you play it. You know, it's almost like you cycled a card, except you're left with an enchantment on the field that you could bargain. Um, if it sticks around, maybe it'll draw you a bunch of cards card seems good. Even for standard, I would say this card seems quite good. I would go ahead and craft it. It's just an uncommon. All right, welcome to Sweet Tooth. We got a Saga. First off, it makes a 1-1 one, one token. Um, secondly, it makes a food token. So I want to just say here that when you've gotten to Chapter 2, right, you played it, you know, it did its thing. Next turn, you untap. You, you're on chapter two. You've got a human token, a food token, and Welcome to Sweet Tooth still hasn't gotten to chapter three yet. That turn, you've got three things that you could bargain. And you don't ever have to get to chapter three on Welcome to Sweet Tooth. You could just bargain it away right then, and then it still gave you two other things to bargain in the future. So um, this puts a whole lot of material onto the battlefield. If you do get to chapter three, uh, you put X plus one plus one counters on a creature you control, or X is one plus the number of foods you control. 
So just this card by itself should be, be putting out two plus one plus one counters. And it did make a creature, so... You know, th this card represents turning the 1-1 one, one into a 3-3 three, three and uh, leaving you with a food. If you had no other cards, if there was nothing else going on, the opponent was not interacting with you. Even if you're not in a food deck, this seems like it would be great for a bargain deck. And maybe not bad in some other builds too. Um, yeah, this card seems very flexible to me, and I would definitely consider it as part of the uh, toolbox. Hollow Scavenger. We got a wolf. But first, we got a bakery raid. One green sorcery adventure. Create a food token. That's cool. There are a couple of spells uh, that have a one mana create a food uh, floating around this set. This one's just a common. Uh, on the, you know, back side later, you get a 3-2 wolf. You can pay one and sack a food and give this plus two, plus two until end of turn. You can only do this once each turn. So, just the prospect of being able to make a food for one mana and later casting a 3-2 for three is uh, not terrible. And if you're in a food-themed deck, then this can threaten to become a 5-4 with activation, which is big enough to matter. It's big enough to trade with Shouldreds and get into fisticuffs with most things in standard. So, yeah, the card actually looks all right. Um, you'll probably have better things to do most of the time, but uh, this is a good budget option. All right, Return from the Wilds. You choose two of these. Search your library for a basic land, put it onto the battlefield tapped and shuffle. Uh, most of the time you probably want to choose that one. Ramping is very, very good. It's one of the biggest things you can do. It's not only putting you up a card, it's putting you up mana. Uh, but you get to choose two things. You can also create a 1-1 one, one human creature token. So you can have a blocker, extra attacker, um, something to sacrifice. And you can also make a food token. Again, can be something to sacrifice, can do artifact synergies, can do life gain synergies. It's a very, very flexible card. Um, I'm impressed, actually, with a lot of the green cards in the set. Uh, this one seems really exceptionally useful for a variety of decks good for a ramp deck, right? It can ramp your mana and give you a chump blocker. It's good for a food deck. It's good for a bargain deck. You know, later in the game, uh, you don't have to find a land. If you have lots and lots of mana, you can make a 1-1 one -one and a food token, have a chump blocker, gain three life, give you two things that you could bargain with. And that's more of a delay tactic, maybe, but maybe a delay tactic's what you need. Um, all the way around, uh, this card seems like it's something that gets you from the early game into the mid to late game. It bridges that gap. Um, so I like it. I think this could have the chops, uh, not just for budget decks. Tangle Span Lookout, we got a 2 3 Seder. For three, whenever an aura enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. So this is for an aura deck. Now, I don't know if we can make that work in standard or work with green in standard, but uh, I'll just say that ossification is an aura. So if you're in green-white, um, this will draw you cards when you play your ossifications. Uh, green also has a couple of stellar auras. Audacity is one of the standouts because it's so cheap. Um, it puts so much threat onto the battlefield and when the audacity hits the graveyard you draw a card. So audacity and ossification 
start to point you a little bit towards an aura deck. I don't know how much else there is to fill it out with, but um, this will draw you cards for uh, signing up to do it. Now, unfortunately, a 2-3 three for 3 dies to a cut down, and that is not the best in standard. But you could uh, bait the opponent with some other early drop creatures that are eating up their cut downs instead. Um, basically, anything that has enough value baked into it might find a way to uh, build a deck around. Uh, this one's more narrow, though. Craft it if you're interested. Knight of the Sweet's Revenge. Uh, we have an uncommon enchantment for four. Makes a food token. It also gives food you control. Tap at a green. Um, that right there, it's not hard from what I've seen in the set to get a whole bunch of food onto the battlefield. There are some other cards like uh, Rocco that can put out a bunch of food as well. That if you have a decent chunk of food, and this will make at least one when it comes out, so it, it can give you a mana back right away. Then you could pretty handily double spell. You know, you could play this and then run right into another four drop or something. And if you untap with it, then you might have ramped right on up to, you know, 8-9 mana or something. You can also pay 7, sacrifice this, creatures you control get plus X plus X in, until end of turn, where X is the number of foods you control, activate only as a sorcery. So that is something that the opponent sees coming a mile away. If they're paying any attention, they should be aware of the threat of activation. But... Um, it's interesting that the food ramps you up to the following turn being able to use that effect. So if you were able to pile a bunch of, you know, creatures and food, and some creatures in the set are also food. Uh, we just looked at Tough Cookie, for example. It's a food. Then that counts for the plus X plus X. I'm not quite sure if this card is good enough, but since there are things like Hollow Scavenger that can make a food for one mana, or incidentally happen to make food along the way, like Welcome to Sweet Tooth, then it seems like Knight of Sweet's Revenge could, could do a real piece of work. It seems like a very silly card and a silly theme, but um, silly things can still kill you. All right, Howling Galefang. We have a 4-4 Beast. It has Vigilance. It also has Haste, as long as you own a card in Exile that has an Adventure. So, the easiest way, of course, to do that is to play Adventure creatures with the Adventure first, which puts them in Exile, and then this will be a 4-4 Vigilance Haste. The question of whether that's good enough in Standard is kind of an open question. Uh, we have 4-4 four, four Trample Hastes already, available in the format, even available in green. They see Fringe play. So is Vigilance better than Trample? Maybe. Since everyone cares about board presence now, the ability to block might be make this more valuable than trample it sounds crazy but it seems like the lot of vigilance as a keyword has risen and risen and risen over the years to where it's getting more and more respect it's also a threat that uh plays right around the wandering emperor there's also a new fairy uh, that has an adventure where it destroys a tapped creature so there are cards that this plays around. And it leaves you with a blocker while presenting a pretty good offense. And what it demands of you is that you play adventures, which is pretty easy. 
And uh, this would also be true, it would still have haste. If you had like an adventure creature in your graveyard, the opponent exiles it with a graveyard trespasser, then you would own a card in exile that has an adventure. And that would be true forever. <laughs> forever! It's in exile for the rest of the game. Sahal and Gale things are going to have haste for the rest of the game. It could come up. Probably will come up. So I don't know for I don't know for certain if this is good enough. It's certainly worth trying in a budget deck. Agatha's Champion. So again, we're looking at budget options here. This is a 4-4 Trampler for 5. That on its own would not be any good, but if it is bargained, then when it ETBs, it fights up to one creature you don't control. And that could make this, you know, a, a pretty reasonable on-rate green creature plus removal spell. You know, if the opponent doesn't counterspell it or whatever, comes down, kills one of their fairies. Um, sounds pretty good. Unfortunately, it's not quite big enough to uh, fight a Shouldred. So there are some things that it doesn't tangle with. But there are an awful lot of creatures in Standard that this could uh, kill. So, is it worth it? Can it make it? Um, I would say as a budget option, it's certainly worth playing, worth trying out. I don't know if it'll get there if you've got a more filled out collection with more rares and mythics. Beanstalk Worm. This is one of the cards I'm most excited about. Um, so Azusa's Many Journeys has been a great boon to me and my green decks um, throughout this leg of standard. It's made them playable where they might other, might not otherwise have been. It makes tap lands very playable. Right, because with Azusa's Many Journeys, and I'm looking at Plant Beans here, the adventure. I'm comparing it to Azusa's Many Journeys. Right, you get a tap land down on turn one. On turn two, you play an untapped land. You know, basic forest, whatever. Then you play Plant Beans or Azusa's Many Journeys. You play another tapped land out of your hand. Now you're all set up on turn three to have at least three mana. Maybe four. Now, if you do that starting with the Azusa's Many Journeys, then, you know, you've got this saga cooking along that's going to gain you three life and turn into a 3-3. Three, three. Uh, the Beanstalk Worm gets you this uh, upfront advantage, ramps you along, gets you up to five mana faster to play the 5-4 with reach. And all of that together, a 5-4 with reach is big enough to trade with just about anything that gets played in standard. Not some of the very biggest um, over-the-top ramp pieces and cards, but it matches up very well against, you know, cards like Shouldred, um, most of the flyers that commonly see play in the format. It, uh, it's pretty great. And I'm excited to play a full playset of this and a full playset of Azusa's Mini Journeys and just run some decks that have like 28 to 34 lands. <laughs> Including maybe a bunch of, uh, you know, creature lands, things I can animate, things have added value. Because when you, uh, when you run that many lands, you want to get some extra value out of your mana base. So if you can animate them into creatures, or, you know, produce, like, Phyrexian Mites with Mirex, stuff like that. Or, you know, maybe Argoth with Making the Bears. <laughs> Do a Titania deck. There's a lot of good potential, as long as you can hit all those land drops, that it's going to ramp you up to uh, cards long before the opponent was ready for those cards. You know, when you start playing your seven drops on turn, you know, five, <laughs> that can be rough for the opponent. Um, they might not have, they might have been able to deal with you 
otherwise, but if you get a Titan of Industry down on turn five, then they might not be able to win the game from that position. You know, you get a 7-7 seven, seven and a 4-4 four, four and you gain five life and now you're out of reach. I really like this card. I recommend crafting it. If, if you really don't play ramp, then you can skip on by. But this card looks so, so good to ramp for me. Alright, Stormkeld Vanguard. Comments I made earlier about um, Artifact Enchantment Removal. The Troublemaker, oof. This adventure is kind of like a disenchant. It's a sorcery. You can't do it at instant speed. Just blows up an artifact or enchantment just straight up. And then you have this 6-7 uh, six, for 6. It can't be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. I tried this out in the uh, early access. I've got a big game that I threw down with Power Dragon on. And uh, this card actually uh, tripped him up in the last key big assault. You know, my Alpha Strike turn against him. Because he couldn't block it with creatures power 2 or less, he ended up blocking with the Tortoise, right, that... Um, it gives land creatures plus one, plus one, and that ended up shrinking his other creatures to where other things that had blocked died in the combat. And he wasn't able to come back and try to uh, put together a return assault that would kill me. So the ability mattered, in other words. Not being able to be blocked by something small. It looks like junk. But the adventure is incredibly playable. So many decks you run across on ladder are going to have artifacts and enchantments, even if it's just incidentally, right? Like uh, the red deck might run uh, Kimono Face's Kakazan, and you could have a very good opening where if you if you're on the play, right? Red deck opens Kimono Face's Kakazan, you take a point. Your turn two. You blow up that Kimono Face's Kakazan, they never get the plus one counter or the 2-2 two -two with haste. And now you've got this giant warrior waiting in the wings for when you get to that late stage of the game. This card is much better than it looks, I believe. I mean, the art's cool, don't get me wrong, but... Most people would probably think that, you know, it looks kind of junky, like some limited chaff or whatever. But the adventure on this, I think, is so well suited for our format. That the, uh, the creature is just kind of additional value, right? A big chunk of beef that you can throw down later. In the meantime, you've blown up their, uh, you know, wedding announcement, their, uh, Skrelv's Hive, their Iron Crag, I could go on. It's good. I think this is actually really good. Hamlet Glutton. So this is a budget option. Um, I'm pretty certain if you have a lot of rares and mythics that uh, you're not going to need this. Uh, so the question with this card for a budget deck is... Uh, would a 5-5 five, five Trampler, sorry, would a 6-6 six, six Trampler, 6-6, six, six, for 5 mana that gains you 3 life, would that be worth it in standard? You know, you're, you're doing a budget deck. You're doing a bargain deck. Would it be worth it to you at, as a 5 drop to get down a 6-6 six, six Trampler that gains you 3 life? I think, depending on your deck, the answer is yes. Um, so the Hamlet Glutton uh, is about the same size as Vorinclex, right? Now Vorinclex has Reach, and that is a very noteworthy ability. Um, Hamlet Glutton gains you three life, uh, which is, you know, interesting. It doesn't find you two forests. You have to bargain in order to get it down for five mana. 
that's obviously not as good as a Vorinclex, but it's like the same size. It's a 6-6 Trampler. It has other things it does, meaning that it gains you 3 life. This could be a very stabilizing presence for you against a red deck. Or against a different aggressive start, like uh, Soldiers or Mono White or something. Not necessarily, but um, this is one of the ways that you can start to uh, retake the board uh, from a position of being slightly behind. Right, someone can get out ahead of you a little bit. This is a card, because of its size and the life that it gains, that it might be able to stabilize you. And then you start to outsize their board, and then you reach a point that you can alpha strike them dead with a bunch of tramplers. And this card plays into all of that relatively well. I'm not going to tell you to craft this card if you've got a good collection. Right? We've, we're talking about a budget deck here. But I think for a budget deck, this is actually pretty strong. All right, now it's time to craft some cards. I don't expect you to craft as many green cards as I am because I love green. But um, putting my money where my mouth is on this one. All right, on to the rares and mythics. Uh, Bramble Familiar, if you're not aware, this card is part of a combo with a battle named Invasion of Alara. That battle um, looks through your deck until it finds a spell with converted mana cost four or less. The Bramble Familiar is two. It lets you play that spell for free. The way that adventures work, it's still considered the same card, so you can catch, you can cast Fetch Quest for free instead of the Bramble Familiar. So you play this Invasion of Alara, some of your only things that cost four or less in the deck are the Bramble Familiar. You hit a Bramble Familiar, you play the Fetch Quest, you mill seven cards, you pull something back from your graveyard to the battlefield, and if that happens to be, uh, what's it called, the uh, Cemetery Desecrator, Cemetery Desecrator. If you pull this back, then if you bend another card that had a converted mana cost of seven or more, you can choose to remove seven or more counters from the Invasion of Alara and then cast the backside of it. And the backside of it is a heck of a spell. Uh, it does a bunch of things. You can draw two cards. You put an artifact from your hand onto the battlefield, you can make a copy of a permanent that you control. Um, it, it just does a bunch of stuff. So it is one heck of a turn to play Invasion of Alara, hit the Bramble Familiar, mill things into the grave, get the De Cemetery Desecrator, flip the Invasion of Alara. It's a very explosive turn. Now, uh, people are more aware of the deck at this point, but it's still something you could try to build. And uh, as to whether or not Bramble Familiar is good otherwise, of course it is. It's a two drop for two that taps for green. It's fine. <laughs> it's a mana creature. Um, you can also pay to tap discard a card and bounce it back to your hand. And the reason you would want to do that, of course, is to play the fetch quest. So you can get this down early, ramp your mana, give you a presence on the battlefield, and later in the game, if this is still around, you can bounce it back to your hand and fetch quest. It is good. It is a good card. Um, it is pretty good, even outside of that combo. So a uh, totally reasonable craft here. Elvish Archivist, I don't know for sure, I don't know for certain that this is a good craft, but it's a two mana card that can draw you cards when enchantments enter the battlefield under your control. That only triggers once each turn, but um, it's a source of card draw in an enchantment deck. 
and it's just two mana to do that. And that could be well worth it. The other thing this does is an artifact deck. When an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, it gets two plus one plus one counters. That only triggers once each turn. And uh, just to be clear, there are indeed uh, cards that put out enchantments and artifacts both. Right? Like enchantments that put out artifact tokens. We just looked at one and was welcome to Sweet Tooth. So it's not impossible that you could hit up both sides of the card within the confines of a single deck. The card draw is the really good part of this card. But turning it into a giant threat's not bad either. So, uh... Requires some deck building consideration, but it's good. It's pretty good. Uh, Feral Encounter, this is a card uh, people are very divided on. As to whether it's going to be really good or really mediocre or bad. I think the card is alright. And I think it's good enough to see play in a certain kind of deck. I think the deck needs to be low to the ground. I think it needs to be more aggressive. So you're going to want one drops. One of the one drops that you might want is the uh, little death touch snake. It's like an enchantment creature from uh, Neon Dynasty. Getting a 1-1 one -one death toucher down means that uh, as early as the second turn, you could make this... Uh, damage one of the opponent's creatures, just death touches it dead. And having one drops in the deck like that mean that uh, with as little as three mana, you could play this and possibly have a hit of a creature you reveal that you could cast the same turn, even if you'd, all you have is three mana. And I think that's when this card starts to look really good. So, yeah, if you are running an aggressive green deck and you're looking for removal in your aggressive green deck, this can be a source of removal and card advantage both. And it can hit you into your one and two drops uh, without costing an arm and a leg in terms of the amount of mana. I don't think this looks as good in a ramp deck. It would be okay there. You have more mana to play with in a ramp deck. And you always have to have some uh, little pieces to ramp you up in a ramp deck. And if those are creatures, like Topiary Stomper, stuff like that, then uh, it's not unreasonable that with five mana, you could Feral Encounter, have one of your creatures damage something to kill it, and still have mana left over to reveal a Topiary Stomper and play it. Um, but I think it looks better in an aggressive green deck. I don't know if we can build that deck. I don't know if it's going to exist in the format. But if you're angling to build that deck, this could possibly serve well there. All right, Huntsman's Redemption. The only reason I bring this card up is the second chapter. So chapter one is, you know, fine. Makes a 3-3 three, three beast, it costs three. Nothing really to say there. Chapter two, you can sacrifice a creature, and if you do, you get to tutor for a creature or a basic land. And tutoring for a creature is interesting. Um, that can find you, you know, right to one of the key cards of your deck. It doesn't have to be a combo deck, but it could be. I could find you a combo piece, but in, in just like a normal, you know, kind of mid-rangey deck, you could go find Shouldred. You played this on three, and then, you know, the next turn, you sacrifice your smallest thing and go find Shouldred. And make sure that you have Shouldred ready on turn four. Um, or whatever else that you're doing. The fact that you're tutoring means that you can 
add some silver bullets into your deck that you wouldn't normally run because you have the ability to tutor them up. Now you need a creature to sacrifice. It can't be like an artifact or an enchantment or a token. It has to be a creature. But still, uh, there are plenty of ways to set that up. And then you can make your deck kind of a toolbox where you go find the thing that you need. You can find something to blow up an artifact or enchantment. You can find something to kill a creature. You can find something to draw cards. Something that blocks flyers. You know, it's it's this neat toolboxy effect that you get on chapter two. And that's the part of the card that interests me. Uh, it's the same reason I was interested in Vivian. I'm sure you've forgotten about Vivian again. <laughs> And chapter 3, up to two target creatures, each get plus 2, plus 2, and gain trample until end of turn. I wouldn't hold my breath on that one hitting just right, but if it does, then you could cause a lot of pressure to the opponent, a lot of pressure to their planeswalkers, maybe close out the game. You know, chapter 3 is the one I'm the least interested in, but it could still do work, so... I'm not going to tell you I don't love this card, I'm not going to tell you to craft it, but if the idea of tutoring for creatures is interesting to you, and if you think you might like to make an aristocrat-style deck where you're sacrificing things anyway, and you want to put green in the deck, this could be a neat thing to add in there. Sentinel of Lost Lore. I have had a chance to play around with this card a bit, um, like on early access. And even if I was not, um, you know, returning my adventures or uh, putting the opponent's adventures away, just getting a 3-4 for 3 that exiles the player's graveyard is actually pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, this is an elf that Nyssa could fetch up out of your deck, um, if you're running Nyssa. Uh, it's an elf that, if you think you want to try to build an elf tribal deck, is a good, solid chunk of elf that has neat utility. And if you're building an adventure deck, then this can regrow, reset your adventures for you so you can cast them again. You know, like the one that blows up artifacts and enchantments, that seems like a great one to reset back to your hand. Or, you know, there's adventures that let you uh, draw cards, or like exile cards, you can play them till end of turn, stuff like that. There's a ton of utility baked into this card depending on what your deck's doing. And it's not bad just as presented. And you can do all of these. You don't have to pick just one. So, the opponent has, uh, you know, an adventure creature they're getting ready to play from exile. You put it on the bottom of their library. It's gone. Gone! <laughs> and you can regrow one of your adventures. And you can exile their graveyard at the same time. That won't come up all that often, but, uh, well, occasionally. You're going to feel like uh, <laughs> you're pretty clever when that happens. All right, Blossoming Tortoise. This card is neat. Um, turtles are my favorite animal in real life, so I may have to uh, try to make a Blossoming Tortoise deck here at some point. It's not bad. You get a 3-3 for 4. When it ETBs or attacks, you mill 3 cards, you return a land from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So this can ramp you and uh, if you make sure that you've sent a land to the graveyard, right, like the uh, new Capenna fetches, could uh, go find you a basic forest, gain you one life, and then when the tortoise comes down, even if you whiff with the mill, you can still go get that uh, sacrifice fetch land, pull it back, and get the value off the tortoise and ramp you. It also makes activated abilities of lands cost one less to activate. Um, 
that is a pretty big deal that can make your creature lands cheaper to activate. It can also take your utility lands, you know, things that are like blowing up your opponent's non-basics, things that are like Mirex making creatures. All of that gets cheaper. All of that looks pretty good next to the tortoise. And land creatures you control get plus one, plus one. So there again, there's a whole nother consideration of deck building of the kinds of cards you might want to put next to it that get a benefit, a boost from the tortoise. Right, so the rate of a 3-3 three, three for 4 looks bad, but it does a lot of stuff. Just the fact that you can pretty reliably ramp yourself and get this body on the field. And then the opponent is kind of obliged to get rid of it, or you, if your deck's built around it, it's going to put a lot of value in your hands. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. Um, you know, obviously it would be better if it was like, I don't know, a 3-5. <laughs> or if it had Vigilance, or whatever. <laughs> but I think it's pretty good as presented. Uh, Gruff Triplets. I've seen some people playing around with this card. One of the more interesting things I've seen people do with it is uh, copy the ETB trigger. Now, the way I saw someone do this was with the blue virtue. Um, but Elishnorn, Mother of Machines, would also do that just fine. And uh, Gruff Triplets uh, becomes a heck of an imposing card at that point. Right, then you have not uh, three of them that you're looking at, but five of them, right? It, it made four tokens instead of two. And they still have that text about putting plus one, plus one counters equal to its power. Which means the more tokens of it you put out, unless you sweep the board, unless you kill every single one of them, the ones that are left are going to be enormous. And that's from the threat of one after its ability gets copied. And when there's that much threat from one card, it starts to look like it could be a real thing instead of a meme. So is Gruff Triplets for you? I'm... You know, it's kind of going in a different direction than uh, some of the decks I build. A lot of the decks I build are more focused on value. Right, they're focused on uh, gaining me value, blowing up the opponents like artifacts and enchantments, drawing me cards, ramping up land, all of that. Gruff Triplets goes off in a totally different direction of you know, flooding power and toughness onto the board to try to win the game. And if they get hit by a board sweeper that kills all of them, then you're just out the card. Any cards, any gruff triplets, you're just out at that point. It did, it did nothing if you hit a board sweeper. Although, I will say that uh, one gruff triplets by itself might merit a board sweeper from your opponent. So anytime you can kind of trade one for one with their sweepers, you can kind of cat and mouse a game where you... Uh, get all the sweepers out of their hand, and then eventually you're able to build a position they can't deal with anymore. It's a different way to play. It's a different kind of angle to attack from. Uh, I might have to try it at some point. I'm not totally sold on them, but I have seen them do work. So, could be a real thing. All right, Virtue of Strength. I have seen people use this card. I'm still not convinced. Some of the people that I've seen use this card, it didn't seem like they had a specific purpose for getting to like 30 or 40 mana. Uh, it kind of felt like it was a win more board state where uh, they could have played other things that cost like 7 to 9 mana and still won the game or lost the game 
from that position. And, you know, it's got the ad adventure where you can put a creature or land from your graveyard back to your hand. That part's good. I do like that. Um, you know, it, it seems, again, the, uh, the new Capenna fetches that uh, find a basic, gain you a life. That would be a way to guarantee that you've got a land in your graveyard to regrow back to your hand to get more value out of again. I do like that style of deck. And it is finding you basics that work with the other part of the card. I'm not sold on it, though. Um, you know, what is, what is the reason that I'm playing this and getting up to 30 or 50 mana instead of playing a Titan of Industry or a Portal to Phyrexia? Why do I need that much mana? In a game of Commander, I think you could sell me on it because you're trying to beat three other people who have like 40 life. You need to go over the top in Commander. In Standard, eh. <laughs> I'm unconvinced at this moment. There could be some combo deck or interaction that comes along that makes it sensible. But I'm not sold yet. Thunderous Debut, on the other hand. This, I think this is an amazingly powerful spell. I think Thunderous Debut has some of the same pedigree as some ridiculously broken instants and sorceries up at the 7-8 mana range that we've seen in the past. Right? Like some of those giant 3 mana spells. Um, forget what they're called just now. I wasn't playing as much at the time. Thunderous Debut has that kind of power level baked into it. Now, it only looks at the top 20 cards of your library, which is um, weak, I will say. Weak. <laughs> Someone was afraid. Someone was afraid when they made this card. So they put this clause in there to hold it back. I don't know what they were afraid of. But they didn't want another tooth and nail. So they made it to where if it's not in the top 20 cards it's not a guaranteed thing anyway you can build your deck to where you almost certainly get a couple of great hits when you cast this spell and they don't have to be green right you could put out atraxa and toxril or you can get a couple of Titans of Industry, you know. You just fill your deck with a bunch of giant things. And as long as you bargain this, then they come on down. So, uh, you need a little bit of consideration of making sure you have something to bargain, but that's not that hard. And it's especially not that hard to set it up by the time you get to 8 mana. So, yeah. I think Thunderous Debut looks pretty great, and I'm looking forward to playing with it in Standard. I'm definitely going to be crafting some. And that brings me to the crafting portion here. So, um, what are the things I believe in the most? I believe in Thunderous Debut. I think this is going to be a big deal. I'm going to go ahead and craft my second copy. Bramble Familiar seems pretty absurdly good. I'm, I have this contrarian side of me where I don't like crafting things that are popular. But I'm going to go ahead and craft one of these. They seem very useful, very flexible. You know, kind of what's not to like. Yeah. Let's go ahead and get a Bramble Familiar in here. Sentinel of Lost Lore seems like uh, a card that could really make an adventure deck tick, could really make an elf deck tick. Um, the Graveyard Hate has been useful when I've used it. 
overall, I'm excited to, uh, you know, give it a shot. So, I'm gonna try at least the one. And Blossoming Tortoise. As I said, I love turtles. Uh, this one plays well with land themes, and I do like making land-themed decks. So, I'm gonna see what kind of shenanigan shenanigans I can get into with this turtle. Rest assured, I will be using more wild cards to craft more green cards. Um, but for the sake of this crafting guide, I'm going to stop there. And uh, next time, we're going to pick up at Multicolor. That's going to include the monocolor cards that have an off-color adventure. Because I want to analyze a card assuming that you're able to cast every part of it. So I'm going to treat them like multicolor cards. So, uh, like, subscribe, um, please check out my other videos. Checking out the other videos matters even more than liking them. And until next time, never stop honing your critical thinking and empathy.